Timely Love The Good Witch Matchmaker, Book One Written by Kate Lawley Narrated by Sonia Field Prologue Math Gorgeous, fascinating, magical math Glenda loved the word magic of spells and working up a nicely complex potion using research, rare ingredients, and chemistry made her toes tingle. But no variety of magic quite compared to the beauty and the power of magical math. Sparkly numbers hovered in the air, the equation lovely in its elegance and surprising in its conclusion. A man, made prisoner by his own grief, and a woman, too caught up in the daily grind to look for love. Not so very improbable a match, but when those two lonely souls lived more than a hundred years apart, that was an improbable match and a worthy challenge for Glenda's special matchmaking skills. Her equation proved these two lonely souls made the perfect match. And with Glenda Good playing matchmaker, this particular improbable match had every chance of success. Chapter 1 Beth didn't enjoy shopping. She didn't hate it, just felt that it was a box to be ticked. She tackled grocery shopping with a list and bought most of her clothes online. Her size was always the same, she knew the styles that suited her, and her favorite brands were all available on the internet. Shopping online was efficient. So why was she standing in a tiny shop, perusing odds and ends that had seen better days? She didn't remember what had drawn her inside, but here she was, window shopping. Small trinkets, old but not antique china, costume jewelry, and a feather boa wrapped around a mannequin's neck— the store was a repository for abandoned bits and pieces of people's lives, items that were no longer important or wanted. Beth frowned. She wasn't one to wax poetic or to wallow in overwrought sentiment. Why was she even in this store? She was about to turn and leave. She really did have several errands to run today. When a bound leather volume caught her eye. Twenty dollars, just for you, just today. A blonde woman with an updo that managed to look both stylish and untidy at the same time peered at Beth over a pair of reading glasses. Very handsome and perfect for you in every way. Beth took a discreet step back. Pushy salespeople made her uncomfortable. And handsome? A journal? Beth looked back at the leather book and then frowned. It actually was handsome. Brown leather that had remained supple over time, and gold-embossed swirls. Hmm. She did love old books. Not at all practical, but every woman had her weakness. Just as she was about to pick it up, the oddness of the woman's other comment hit her. Why just for her? Huh. That was too strange. No, Beth shook her head. With a polite smile, she said, No, thank you. The woman handed her a card. Just in case you change your mind. But it may not be here tomorrow. Beth placed the card in her purse without looking at it and took another step back. All right then. Thank you. And before the woman could use some other pressure tactic, Beth hurried out of the store. She had errands to run. And she couldn't even remember why she'd gone into the store in the first place. So odd. Chapter 2 you won't believe what I bought today. Hmm? Beth tucked the phone tighter against her chin and read the email she'd just written. Not quite right. She cut the first sentence, softened the wording at the end. Much better. Beth, are you paying attention? If you need to work, we can talk later. Beth winced. Sorry, Hill. I'm done. I promise. Beth clicked save and closed her laptop. There. Now she really was done. And I was listening. What did you buy? I found this great feather boa. It's the perfect accessory for that flapper costume I have. Hillary was well into a detailed description of the flapper costume in question and how fabulously the boa complimented it when Beth had a strange feeling. Did you say a coppery brown? Uh-huh. It's luscious. Vintage from the 20s or that's what the shop lady said. 
that it was worth every penny, even if it is a modern reproduction. The thing is gorgeous. Wait, the shop lady? She didn't have blonde hair and reading glasses. Blonde, for sure, but I don't know about the glasses. Hillary laughed. Why do you ask? You can't tell me you've actually been to the good witch. Hang on. Beth swiveled in her chair and grabbed her purse off the filing cabinet behind her desk. As she dug in her purse for the card she'd stuffed into a side pocket, she said, It's silly, really. It's just that I saw a boa like the one you're describing earlier today when I was out running errands. Ha, here it is. She read off the card. Glenda Good, the Good Witch, Vintage Costumes, Jewelry, and Knickknacks. Beth snorted. It says at the bottom, where improbable matches are made. She makes it sound like a dating service. Don't you dare mock. Finding the perfect accessory for a favorite outfit or a ravishing gown for a special occasion is a true art. The Good Witch always has exceptional stock. It's a gem. I only wish there were more shops like it in town. Hillary's impassioned speech was hardly surprising. She cobbled together a reasonable living buying clothes and accessories for private clients, putting together costumes for special events, and sharing her vast knowledge with the world via her blog and freelancing articles. So, you know this Glenda Good woman? Beth asked. Actually, no. She's got a few assistants that I usually deal with. I always thought she lived out of the country, maybe England? Natasha helped me today, but I did see a blonde woman in the back. I was in a rush, so it's possible she was the owner and Natasha didn't have time to introduce me. Have you developed a sudden passion for the finer things in life, little Beth? Hillary's teasing tone just made Beth laugh. I'd hardly call the good witch's stock fine. But no, I haven't become a shopping fiend overnight. I had a strange experience there earlier today. She tried to pressure sell me an old book. Darling, if that was Glenda Good and she thought you should buy the book, you should have bought the book. She's the owner and lead buyer for the store and she has exceptional taste. Hillary paused and Beth heard the tap of Hill's nails in the background. Don't you think it's practically psychic that the woman recommended an old book and you're a nut for old books? It's your one weakness. You should go back and pick it up. I don't know... Besides, she said it likely wouldn't be there tomorrow. It's 4.30. You have plenty of time. Go on. Splurge. You deserve it. What the heck? I am caught up for the day. All right, I'll go back and give it a look. I'll reconsider my first impression of the famous Glenda Good. So far, she doesn't exactly match up with your description of her. Uh-huh. And since we both know you're completely full of it, tell Miss Good that I have impeccable taste and only the very best will do. Are you kidding? Beth thought she'd been sneaky. No way she'd go back to some strange store for an old book when she had a special relationship with Mr. French, purveyor of rare and antique books. But she didn't think Hillary would guess that. Your birthday isn't for two months. Why would you think I'm buying your present, Miss Egocentric? Because you always plan ahead, and I did just drop a huge birthday gift-buying hint. But I applaud your good judgment. Go forth, ask for Glenda Good's advice, and be generous with your wallet. You know you love me enough for a decent gift. You are outrageous. Beth shook her head, but she couldn't help smiling. And greedy. But I think you might be worth a Glenda Good-approved gift. She was about to hang up when Hillary said, Oh! And buy that book. Beth just laughed and ended the call. Chapter 3 Beth pulled into a small parking lot across the street from the Good Witch. As she gathered up her purse, she remembered again how different Hillary's description of the shop was from her own impression. Beth paused with the car door open, feet already on the pavement. She remembered feeling a little sad, surrounded by so many lost objects much like the one time she'd gone to the pound with a girlfriend to help her pick out a puppy. All those lost souls. Beth shook her head. The shop wasn't filled with lost souls. It was filled with objects that had history. She exited the car and firmly shut the door behind her. But history, by its very definition, was in the past. She walked briskly through the door, convinced she could get in and out with minimal fuss if only she maintained a business-like attitude. And if she picked up that book. You changed your mind. 
Lovely. I knew you would. Glenda pulled the leather-bound volume from a shelf as she spoke. The retrieval of the book and its subsequent presentation to Beth was accomplished with an economy of movement that was surprising in a woman who seemed so... scattered. Beth accepted the book with a smile of thanks. It was warm and heavy in her hands. She resisted the impulse to open it. It didn't matter what was inside. She was only buying the book as an excuse to pick Glenda's brain. She tucked the book under her arm and said, While I'm here, I thought I'd also ask your opinion about a birthday gift for a dear friend. She's difficult to shop for. Actually, she's a professional buyer. Your staff know her. Hillary Barrett? Of course. I just missed her earlier, but I'll have a chat with the ladies and see what I can come up with. There's no rush, is there? The question wasn't a question at all. Glenda seemed to already know there was time to spare. Beth plastered a polite smile on her face and shook her head. So, can I just leave my number then? That will do for now. Glenda pivoted and hurried to the register, leaving behind the smell of lavender, sunshine, and fresh linens. Beth drew a deep breath. The scent reminded her of childhood, building forts and playing in the park. She smoothed away the crease she knew was forming in between her eyes, right at the bridge of her nose. She did not need a migraine today. Why did this woman make her feel more stressed out than her most demanding client? She huffed an annoyed breath, but quietly, then followed Glenda to the register. Fifty-four dollars and thirty-four cents. When Beth looked up in surprise, Glenda added, Well, you did run off rather rudely, didn't you? She said the words with a charming smile, clearly not the least annoyed. Beth was too baffled to utter a reply and handed over sixty dollars. Worth every penny, I promise. Now, what was your phone number for your friend's birthday gift recommendation? Glenda tapped the side of her glasses, her gaze drifting off into the distance. Although I do believe I already have the perfect item. Yes, yes, I believe I do. A little more number crunching and I'll know without a doubt. Well, with very little doubt. Her finger stopped its tapping and she shifted her gaze to Beth. Your number, dear? Beth's change, a pad of paper, and a pen were on the counter. How? Never mind. Beth bent down and scribbled her number in writing that was nothing like her usual tidy script. She picked up her newly acquired book and, with a final thank you, hurried out the door. Chapter 4 Beth had been tempted to open the book in the parking lot of the Good Witch. After all, she did love old books— She'd have inspected the book earlier when she first saw it if she hadn't been put off by Glenda's odd manner. But as she sat in the driver's seat holding the book, Beth decided she could wait. If it turned out to be of some value, she would probably want to wear gloves, and a delayed treat would only be that much sweeter. Later that evening, Beth sat down at her writing desk with the leather-bound volume. Not the modular ergonomic computer desk she used during the day for work, but her grandmother's old desk. The small wood writing desk felt like an expression of her tastes, rather than a space dedicated to function. It wasn't valuable, or even in very good condition, with its beat-up edges and scratched varnish, but it was in front of a window with good light and had a comfortable matching chair. And, more importantly, it reminded Beth of her grandmother. The feel of the leather under her fingertips as she followed the faded gold design on the cover was comforting. She cracked open the book and inhaled. There was a unique smell that old books had, a mix of decades of dust, damp, and ink. The odor wasn't in itself particularly pleasant, but Beth loved it for the memories it evoked. She turned the first page. She should have stopped right then and donned her cotton gloves, but she just blinked in surprise and carefully turned a second page and then another. Oh, my. Beth couldn't believe what she was seeing. Her leather-bound volume wasn't a book at all. It was a diary. An old diary. Judging from the handwriting, likely a man's diary. And even though it was almost certainly valuable, she started to read it right away, handling the pages with her ungloved hands. Only when the light streaming through the window had dimmed so much that she could no longer read the elegant script on the page did she realize how much time had passed. She'd only deciphered a few pages in that time because the ink had faded, making the otherwise clean script difficult to read. 
She started to turn on a lamp, but reconsidered when she happened to see the time. Her lower back had grown stiff from the time she'd sat unmoving at her desk, so she took a moment to stretch before she got up. While she puttered around the house, tidying the day's mess, and then still as she prepared for bed, Beth couldn't help but return over and over again to the passages she'd read. A man with no close family, of independent means, going about what was probably a very typical Victorian life. There were no deep emotions conveyed, no special events described, no personal revelations disclosed in those first few passages, and yet she had a sense of the man. Kind, dutiful, sad. How was that possible? How was it possible that she felt as if she'd just had a long conversation with him, a man whose name she didn't know, and who had most likely died more than a hundred years ago? Those questions quickly faded because Beth fell asleep almost as soon as she laid her head down on the pillow. But then, then she had the most peculiar dreams. A cool spring afternoon in a lush green park. Women's lives are different in my time. There's more independence, more choice. Beth inhaled, planning to continue her argument, but the pinch of her corset cut off her breath. And the clothing is much less restrictive and chosen more for comfort and functionality. High heels quickly sprang to mind, but she didn't want to dilute her argument. A handsome face smiled back at her. Comfort isn't the primary consideration when choosing one's attire in this time. It's an intriguing concept. Comfortable clothing fascinates you more than independence for women? Spoken like a man? Beth looked down at the gravel path and her inadequate footwear. Comfort and functionality just ratcheted up a few notches on her priority list. Unfair, he said in a teasing tone. Both are fascinating. But then a stillness settled on her companion's face. Why so serious? Beth stopped, her hand on his arm. Looking ahead on the path, he said, My sister was a poet. She believed education would change the future for women. She's right. Not only education, but that's a large part of it. My sister succumbed to a fever many years ago, so she'll never see those changes. Beth gently squeezed the arm under her fingertips. I'm sorry. A crisp, bright midday with a picnic cloth laid out under a shady tree. Long legs sprawled out on the cloth, he asked. Do all people speak so in your world, in your time? Speech has become increasingly more casual over time. The way I talk is typical. Both men and women use slang. Beth nibbled on her sandwich. Language is alive, ever-evolving. That's one of the reasons I love old books. They're a window into the language of their time. He studied her closely. I'm fond of old texts as well, but I'm more inclined to imagine where the book has been, who has read it, and whether it was treasured or sat unread upon a shelf. Sentimental, perhaps. I'd say charming. Beth picked up another sandwich square from her plate and studiously avoided his gaze. An overcast afternoon in a public garden, the humid air smelling of cut grass and sweet flowers. A hot air balloon? No, I've never ridden in one. Beth considered it. She wasn't sure if the idea was appealing or frightening. Have you? I'd planned to, but time got away from me. He took a sip of his tea and turned to admire a nearby rose bush filled with pale pink blooms. Somehow she knew his response was significant, just like she knew exactly what to say. You should make time. Today. Don't wait any longer. He nodded his agreement. Our time together has taught me that embracing the unexpected can bring surprising rewards. And? His lips curved. And I won't wait? Beth rolled over in bed and snuggled tighter under her covers. Chapter 5 When Beth awoke the next morning, she practically bounced out of bed. She couldn't remember the last time she'd slept so well. And then she remembered the dreams. She unplugged her phone from its charger and rang Hillary. Do you have any idea what time it is? 
Sounding groggy and only half awake, Hillary skipped right over hello. Hill, it's after eight. You've probably already hit snooze at least twice. Beth sank down on the edge of her bed. Besides, I had to tell you about the most bizarre dreams I had about this man. Bedclothes that had been rustling stilled. Did he have a big... Hillary, not that kind of dream. How can you be such a diehard romantic and still have such a dirty mind? Not mutually exclusive. Hillary's words were garbled by the toothbrush she was almost certainly speaking around. Water splashed in the background, and when she spoke next, it was much clearer. But don't keep me in suspense. If it wasn't that kind of dream, then what kind was it? Beth dropped back down on her bed and then scooted back to lounge against the headboard. First, there was a walk in the park, then a picnic and tea in a tiny, beautiful garden. But I have pieces that are all out of context, more like a movie montage than a dream or a memory. Okay, and what's the big deal? That sounds boring and not unusual at all. Well, it wasn't even a little boring, but you're missing the point. Tea as in British tea. A walk in the park as in strolling down a park path in inadequate shoes, a tight corset, and a Victorian gown. A picnic as in antique china and a servant. You had a Victorian dream? Okay, that's a little weird. Wait, it gets weirder. I can describe to you in excruciating detail what it feels like to walk in a tightened corset and skirts that almost drag the ground. Beth slouched on her bed, mostly because she could. I've never had such good posture. Except you didn't. It was a dream. Yes, that's it. I wasn't in a corset or drinking tea because it was a dream. Except I've never worn a corset before, and I certainly have no idea what it feels like. So how is it I can remember exactly how shallow a breath I could take without my lungs burning or my skin pinching? Beth filled her lungs with a deep breath again, just because she could. You have no idea, Hill. I can't even imagine a trip to the bathroom. Ugh, never mind. The point is, I can remember it all as if it actually happened— not in a fuzzy, non-specific way like a dream. Oh, and I like tea with two sugars and lemon. You don't drink tea, and the corset experience sounds unpleasant, but what about this man you mentioned? Who is he? You don't think it's strange that my dreams were so vivid? Freakishly vivid? Not really. If you're that worried about it, though, I can hook you up with an expert. Beth wasn't sure she needed to see a therapist over one night of odd dreams, but if it made her feel better... Maybe? Okay. Who are you seeing? I told you about her. She reads auras, remember? Beth groaned. The fortune teller. Yes, I remember. I don't think I'm quite there yet. She's not exactly a fortune teller. And don't knock it until you try it. But tell me about this man. Was he gorgeous? Beth rolled on her side and tucked her knees close. Well, not gorgeous. More handsome. Dark hair, warm brown eyes, warm like he's actually seeing you, and beautiful manners. He pulled my chair out for me, stood whenever I did, and helped me into the carriage. Oh, I'd forgotten about that. I went on a carriage ride. Tall, short, facial hair? No man bun, right? That wouldn't work in a Victorian setting. But those Victorians loved their facial hair. Spill. Hillary's voice trailed off. Oh, build. Skinny, muscular, now spill. Beth sighed. Definitely clean-shaven. Taller than me, maybe half a foot taller. Broad shoulders. I'm not sure about Bill Hill. He was wearing a suit. Fair enough. Benedict Cumberbatch, Ryan Reynolds, or Channing Tatum. Oh, that's good. Beth closed her eyes, thinking back. Um, Ryan Reynolds, but maybe less... Buff? Beth grinned. Yes, I was thinking bulky, but that works. I don't think the Victorians made it to the gym much. Her grin faded. I feel a little funny talking about him like this. Well, he's just your dream, so you can put your mind at rest. <laughs> You're not betraying confidences or oversharing because he's not real. Does this not real man have a not real name? No, no name. Beth frowned. Why did it feel so much like she was betraying a confidence? She scrunched her eyes shut and gave herself a little mental shake. Hillary was right. She didn't even know his name. He was just a dream. 
She spent the next several minutes recounting her adventures in Victorian England with her unnamed, handsome, and thoroughly attentive escort. And even though Beth knew he was only a dream, there were a few details she kept to herself. First, Beth was convinced that her unnamed man, contrary to all outward appearances, was sad. And second, she remembered the exact moment the dream ended. Her mystery man clutched for her hand as it faded away. Chapter 6 Beth's workday started in low gear, and distracted by dreams she couldn't get out of her head, she made error after error. When lunch rolled around, she decided it was probably in the best interests of both her and her clients if she took the rest of the day off. It was that, or go back and double-check any work she completed and the diary, sitting on her writing desk, begging to be read, had nothing to do with her decision. Beth tapped her fingers on her desk. Who is she kidding? That diary had everything to do with her decision. Maybe if she hurried and finished it, she wouldn't be so consumed by thoughts of its author. No, consumed wasn't the right word. This was no crush. She was intrigued by the mystery of the book and the man. And distracted. Definitely distracted. Right. She tapped the desk firmly. Time to do some reading. She grabbed a cup of coffee and then sat down at her writing desk. As she placed her mug well away from the handwritten pages, she had to stop and marvel at how casually she'd begun to treat the diary. First no gloves, and now she had a drink within spilling distance? The less-than-extraordinary entries must have sparked her dreams. Something within the words spoke to her. Scanning through the first few pages, it didn't take Beth long to find where she'd left off. Her gentleman author had taken a constitutional, a brisk walk through the park near his home, in the last entry she'd read. Beth scanned the words, looking for the entry that followed, but then she paused. Had this entry been the impetus behind her dream, where she'd walked in the park with her mystery man? Possibly. But that didn't explain the picnic or the tea, or her memory of wearing Victorian clothes. She rubbed at the tiny crease forming between her eyes. She took a drink of her still-too-hot coffee and almost scalded her throat. Trying not to sputter coffee on the fine script, she set her mug down. And once she'd caught her breath, she started to read. The writing was fine, elegant, even. And while the events described were commonplace, the words themselves were never dull. Anything but. The author had a dry sense of humor and an eye for interesting details. So it was a mystery to Beth why, for the second time, she'd read only a few pages and was struggling to stay awake. She took several swallows of coffee, but it didn't help. Almost as soon as she started to read, her eyes grew heavy with sleep. There was a rational reason, Beth was certain, because there was always a rational reason. She was probably coming down with a cold or some other bug and just needed the sleep. Convinced that was the answer, she scooped up the book and moved to the sofa. She'd come close to snorting coffee on it. What harm could reading a few pages on the sofa do? She really was developing an odd relationship with this diary. Once she was settled on the sofa and snuggled up with a fluffy blanket, she started to read again. A carriage ride, the sharp rap of hooves on cobbles, the gentle sway of a carriage, the jerk of a pothole. Elizabeth. A firm grip on her forearm turned into a gentle shake. Elizabeth. Beth's eyelids felt like they'd been glued together, but the shaking continued with such a determined persistence that she tried to pull herself awake. She forced her eyes open, and there he was. Whoever he was. Hazel eyes framed with thick lashes met her gaze, and she had to will her hands not to reach out and touch his face. Brown. She'd remembered his eyes as brown. As she tried to orient herself to the bizarre situation, corset, full-length dress with long, tight sleeves, enclosed horse-drawn carriage, strange man, her hazel-eyed companion leaned back against the cushions. With a little more space and a handsome man's face no longer within easy reach, Beth felt less lightheaded and more awake. Who are you? A frown crossed the man's face but was replaced with a more neutral expression before he spoke. I had hoped you'd remember our previous encounters. I'm disappointed, but under the circumstances, it's hardly surprising. Edward Stanbury, and it's a pleasure to see you again. Edward Stanbury offered an abbreviated bow. A throb began to bloom into an ache in Beth's right temple. If this was a dream, 
How is it possible she felt a headache looming? And Edward Stanbury, Mr. Stanbury, Edward, seemed much too real, not at all the indistinct construction she'd expect from a dream. She replayed his words, suspecting she'd missed something important. I'm sorry, encounters? How many times do you think we've met? Several. Again, the flash of disappointment. Tea, walks in the park, a shared picnic. You hold none of those events in your memory. But... The outings Beth had described to Hillary had only been dreams, not memories. To think otherwise was madness. It's not possible. <laughs> this carriage, this dress, you... All of this is simply not possible. Improbable, yes, but the evidence is before you. You are here, as am I. Magic, fate, the hand of God, I do not know. But I believe that you are real, and you are here. Edward leaned across the carriage and reached for her gloved hand. He held the tips of her fingers and looked into her eyes. She blushed at the intensity she saw there, as if he truly knew her. The words that left his lips were barely above a whisper. Live in this moment with me. Share another day with me. Please. When she hesitated, he said, You helped me learn to take chances again. Do you remember? The hot air balloon. Yes. Yes, she remembered that he'd needed to step outside the past, even if it was into a hot air balloon. And yes, she'd share a day with this man. Chapter 7 Edward hadn't realized how solitary his existence had become, not until Elizabeth had appeared in his garden. It had been a quiet day, as most of his days were, and late in the afternoon. Almost exactly one month had passed since that noteworthy day. She was a spark that lit up his dull existence. She'd brought adventure into his life. He would never have suspected her eventual tale of traveling from the future. Why would he? She had been dressed no differently than one would expect, and her speech had been explained, in part, by her colonial origins. At first in apparition, she'd become more solid as the seconds passed. Eventually, she'd become a woman fully formed asleep on a lawn chair, and having seen her fade into existence, a spirit was a reasonable presumption, perhaps. But the future? That had taken time for him to understand. He couldn't help the smile that spread across his face. It had been time he'd enjoyed immensely. Can I ask what's made you so happy? Elizabeth asked, a look of confusion passing across her face. And no wonder, if she had no memory of their previous encounters, Edward had the advantage of their past discussions, the hours they'd spent hypothesizing the cause and purpose of Elizabeth's journey. I apologize. I was recalling the occasion of our first meeting. That's flattering. She gave him a wan smile. Unfortunately, I don't remember that happening. Maybe you could jog my memory? Edward repressed a smile at the odd phrasing. Initially, he'd found it gauche, irritating. Now, he found it endearing. You appeared in my garden? Appeared? I just winked into existence? No. At first, you appeared as a specter, but your form solidified until you were whole. That's just not possible. Elizabeth gave him a speculative look. If you're from a different time... Her chin tilted. He'd come to learn this was a sign of mental effort to dispel confusion with rational thought, and he found it charming. His Elizabeth attempted a rational, reasonable explanation for her arrival in his era each time he encountered her. This is the age of Queen Victoria, 1899. Her eyes narrowed. Then how can you be certain I'm not an agent of the devil or some other aberration? Because I've come to know you and cannot believe that you represent some unwholesome will? Certainly not the devil, should he exist. And you did appear on my lawn chair in a deep slumber. No gentleman would comment upon the gentle snore that had escaped before she'd woken, but the memory made a smile tug at his lips. You seem pretty sure. The tiny crease of worry just atop the bridge of her very fine nose deepened. Have we had this conversation before? We have, indeed, and you were equally as skeptical each time, but my brilliant analysis convinced you to put aside your doubts and embrace the experience of time travel. Wait, 
how many times have we had this conversation? I mean, how many times have we met? Her enchanting countenance turned a pale shade of pink, a certain sign that she was losing her patience. Edward handed her the fan that lay abandoned next to her. Half a dozen, or more. Seven times, with this as the eighth, to be exact. He suspected, however, that such accuracy would only befuddle her further. Elizabeth swept the fan in front of her face with a decidedly unladylike vigor. A dozen? A dozen. The vigor with which she employed the fan increased. But I've only just had the one night of dreams. But I suppose it doesn't have to make sense because it's a dream and they don't make sense. That's how dreams work. Edward listened as she continued in this vein for several minutes. He knew from past experience that she would eventually talk herself into some semblance of equanimity. Finally, she turned to him, chin firm and resolute. Well, if this is a dream, then there's certainly no harm in us enjoying... She looked at the passing scenery just now changing from town to country. What exactly are we doing? I had intended a trip to a rather well-regarded rose garden in the area. The Honourable Stephen Humphreys opens his gardens every third Saturday of the month. Ah, and when I emerge from a carriage that I never entered, your driver will do what, exactly? I'm working on the assumption that people in my dream act like real people, and that he'll flip out, um, react poorly. As soon as the words left her lips, she gave him a curious, intent look. You seem so real. And therein lay the challenge. As soon as he convinced her of the reality of his existence, she disappeared and lost her memory of him. And after seven visits, he had hoped for more. Whoever was directing these encounters, and he was certain some intervening force was at work, they either had a devilish sense of humor or needed to hone their skills. Fate, a trickster, a higher being? He'd posed these questions more than once, several times, to Elizabeth, and always he came back to the same answer. He simply had no explanation, and he was enjoying himself far too much to hope for it to end. Realizing he hadn't answered her question, Edward cleared his throat and said, There's a trick to it, but we've managed in the past. No need to worry. She grinned at him, the tiny dimple in her right cheek peeking out for a moment. All right then, let's tour a well-regarded rose garden. He couldn't help but laugh, because she made his rather dull outing sound as if they were embarking on a grand adventure. And maybe it was, with Elizabeth at his side. Chapter 8 A delicate hint of roses drifted close with each puff of breeze. Even the garden was circumspect. No loud colors or showy blooms in this Victorian refuge. Beth stifled a laugh. The absurdity of the situation kept creeping up on her at the most inopportune moments, and she had to be careful. Inappropriate behavior had consequences in this world that she could barely begin to fathom. She certainly didn't want to embarrass Edward or create difficulties for him. Difficulties for the man who wasn't real. Changing her behavior, that wasn't actually happening, for the man who wasn't actually here. Preoccupied by the paradox, she stumbled on the path. Edward steadied her, paused, and only continued forward when she gave him a reassuring nod. Beth's heart broke a little bit. If this wasn't real, and it couldn't be, then the feelings she'd experienced weren't either. The entire situation was ridiculous. The Victorians were staid and chauvinistic and backward, and yet Edward wasn't. She felt cherished, respected, and very much in control. Notwithstanding the confining clothing and some modification in her public behavior, she'd been as free and open with Edward as she ever was in her modern life. The greatest difference between the two worlds was the attentiveness Edward had demonstrated, and that she'd found utterly lacking in the modern men she'd dated. They never seemed to hear her. Too busy tapping on a phone or trying to find the next witty phrase or interpreting her words before they even left her mouth. Perhaps we should curtail our visit and return to town early, Edward said. She must have looked confused because he added, You've been silent. I thought perhaps you were overtired. And that was another reason Beth was certain she was in a dream. Edward expected that she would be talkative because she usually was and he knew her that well. After one afternoon, impossible. No, not tired. Just thinking. Although... 
Beth peeked around to see if anyone was within earshot. You can speak freely. We've drifted behind the large group of children with their nannies, and the Misters Johnson have fallen increasingly further behind over the last half hour. Edward leaned close and, in a conspiratorial tone, said, The elder Mr. Johnson is relying rather heavily on his cane today, and I don't believe it's due to aching joints. Beth nodded and tried not to laugh. The elder Mr. Johnson was plastered. He'd been taking swigs from a flask of tonic that almost certainly contained hard liquor. Tonic is code, I'm guessing? Maybe for vodka or gin? Brandy, most likely. Some things don't change. Beth shook her head. I'm sure it's impolite to say, but I'm starving. What are the chances we can sneak away for a meal? Excellent. Edward immediately changed course and steered her back the way they'd come. I've already had the coachman procure a basket, so a meal awaits in the carriage. We need only find an inviting spot to enjoy it. You know me this well because you actually are me. I mean, you're a figment of my imagination, and as a figment, you know everything I know. Beth spoke more to herself than to Edward, so she was surprised when he replied, I know you so well because we've spent time together, and as anyone who spends time with you would know, you're frequently peckish. Beth was baffled. Why would her dream self remember Edward with less clarity than Edward remembered her? And how did she reconcile the several visits Edward remembered with her one night of sleep and a single montage of events? She kept putting questions aside to enjoy the moment, only to so immerse herself that she forgot this was a dream. It couldn't be healthy, maybe not even safe. What if she didn't wake up? Oh no, 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 no. Beth stopped, horrified by a thought. Edward covered the hand she rested lightly on his arm with his own and rubbed the top of her gloved hand with his thumb. What's wrong? Is it time? Are you leaving? Confused, Beth met his gaze. No, I mean, I don't think so. She could feel her fingers trembling under his hand. What if I'm in a coma? What if the reason this all seems so real is because I'm unconscious and my brain is in overdrive? Or what if I'm dead? That cannot be. Edward reached down and touched the side of her face with his gloved hand. You are here. You may come from your time without notice and fade away with just as much mystery, but when you are here, you are real. Of my own existence I can only say, I know of no way to prove to you that I am no figment. I can only say that I think I exist as a whole man in your absence. He looked away. I feel in your absence. He turned back to her. I miss you when you're gone. Beth closed her mouth. You do? Edward took an audible breath, and the intimacy of the moment broke when he exhaled upon a broad smile. Don't sound so surprised. You are excellent company. He pivoted back to face the path and walked on as if nothing had happened. Beth didn't know how to reply. Didn't know how to say that he too was excellent company. Why was that sentiment so difficult for her to share? Only after they continued to walk along the path for several seconds did it occur to Beth how risque Edward's behavior might have been. He'd touched her face right out in the open. Even though she liked old books, she was hardly up on old world etiquette, but wasn't that type of behavior frowned on in the uptight days of Queen Victoria? What would Edward's friends think of the situation? Not that she'd met Edward's friends— they seemed to only encounter people he treated as acquaintances. They were close to the house, where the main path rejoined a secondary path leading to the front of the house. Edward excused himself and flagged a servant. After a brief conversation, he returned. I've made our excuses and our coach is being brought around, but I'm afraid you have a headache. Ah, no problem. I can have a headache. Who exactly do these people and your friends think that I am? I'm afraid I've drifted away from my few close friends over the last two years, so inventing a fiction was simple enough. I manufactured a distant relative, as it's well known among my acquaintanceship, that I have no close family. Escorting a young, eligible woman, even a distant relative, so frequently and with such familiarity? Edward trailed off as if the topic might be upsetting to her. Beth bit her lip and raised her eyebrows. They think we're sweethearts? I would never presume to call us such, Edward said. But yes, perhaps a more accurate representation of public opinion is that we have an understanding. Beth shook her head. 
An understanding? An understanding of what? Oh, never mind. They think we're engaged. At Edward's head tilt, she tried again. Engaged to be engaged? Of a sort. Meeting her eyes briefly, he asked, Does that bother you? If it keeps the gossipy masses happy and preserves your reputation, then I'm on board with it. Edward's lips tipped up. The gossipy masses. Sorry. How can you stand my modern language? Everyone here speaks so... Formally? Stiffly. Without freedom. Edward's smile had disappeared. You remind me of my sister. No, she didn't speak as you do, not even a little. But she was a free spirit, like you. Beth again didn't know how to respond. A free spirit? Her? The more she considered it, the more she liked the label. Maybe here, in her dream world of fancy dress and formal speech, she was a free spirit. The thought made her surprisingly happy. They'd arrived at the carriage and Edward handed her up the steps. She was distracted from her musings as she settled herself in the carriage, a time-consuming event given the confining and yet voluminous nature of her clothes. After she'd smoothed her skirts into some semblance of Victorian respectability, she realized two things. First, and most surprising, she believed. Or at least a part of her believed, maybe a small part, and maybe not in Victorian England or time travel, but in Edward. That even a tiny kernel of her practical self could believe in the possibility that Edward was a real person, that was a significant shift in her worldview. She'd have to chew over what it meant later, if she remembered everything. She crossed her fingers, sent up a little prayer, and wished, because she wanted to remember. Her second realization concerned Edward as well, but it had to do with his past. Something, a big something, had happened two years ago, big enough to push Edward away from close friends and for him to remove himself from society. It had been clear to Beth that the people with whom they'd interacted were pleased to see Edward out and about, as if he hadn't been in some time. What exactly had happened two years ago to have such an effect on a man who was so socially adept and obviously well-liked? He didn't seem to dislike people, just the opposite. And he certainly seemed to enjoy her company. Beth didn't think it was his sister, although that certainly was a possibility. It was a mystery but a mystery for another time. The yeasty smell of fresh bread caught her nose. She was starving. Chapter 9 Beth blinked in confusion. She'd been eating, had finished a fabulous meal with... with that man. They had stopped to eat, but had stayed inside the carriage because Beth didn't think she could manage a blanket on the ground. She'd been laughing. She wasn't sure why. He'd handed her a linen napkin. She buried her head into her pillow. What was happening? She'd been in a carriage, a very real carriage, with velvet seats and soft cushions. She could still feel the breeze that pushed through the small windows, brushing her cheek. But if that were true, that simply couldn't be true. Corsets and elaborate updos, carriages and horses, men with beautiful manners, one man who listened, truly listened. Beth growled and pulled her pillow over her head. These dreams were intruding on her real life. Not okay. Worse, it was silly and wrong. She didn't need to dream about a better life. Her life was fine. Better than fine. Her life was full and rewarding and... She yanked the pillow off her head and looked at the clock on her nightstand. Ugh. She'd overslept. Worse, she didn't remember ever going to bed. She'd fallen asleep on the sofa. Weirder and weirder. The ring of her cell had her hopping out of bed. Hopefully it was her morning appointment cancelling. After a quick glance at the caller ID screen, Beth answered the phone and dropped back down on her bed. Hey, Hillary. So, any crazy dreams to report? Beth squished into her down comforter, contemplating how much she should say. I guess so. It's the oddest sensation. I'd swear they were memories. Beth squeezed her eyes shut only to see the face of a nameless man. Obviously, they're dreams, but they feel like memories. Swiss cheese memories, since big pieces are missing, but still, memories. Hillary didn't laugh. 
and she didn't tease. Why do these dreams feel different? The practical question only amplified the oddness of it all. Beth tried to put her finger on what exactly made these last few nights' dreams so real. I remember feeling how heavy the cloth of my dress was, how the yeasty smell of fresh bread made my mouth water, what the breeze felt like on my cheek. I don't dream in that much detail, or if I do, I don't remember when I wake up. But it must be possible, because you are. Beth's phone buzzed, her backup alarm telling her if she hadn't hopped in the shower yet, now is the time to do it. I have to run. I have a client appointment this morning. Okay, but let's talk later. And Beth, try to come up with anything you've changed lately. Diet, exercise, late night TV, that kind of thing. You never know what indigestion can do to a girl. I will. Promise. After Beth hung up and hopped into the shower, she realized there was something new in her life. Both nights she'd gone to bed reading the journal of an unknown Victorian man. Relief swept through her. Of course the journal had something to do with her dreams. The overlap between journal author and mystery dream man were ridiculously obvious. Both were Victorian gentlemen alone in the world. Add a little romantic imagination, a complete lack of romance in her real life, and the dashing, considerate man of her dreams was born. It was so obvious in the light of day. Unfortunately, her reprieve was short. It occurred to her as she headed out the door for her appointment that there was one glaring and decidedly odd detail that was still unexplained. She hadn't mentioned it to Hillary because it seemed so... well, it made her uncomfortable. Just as she could remember the physical sensations of rich cloth touching her skin and the taste of buttery bread on her tongue, she could also remember the emotional connection she had to her unnamed suitor. A thrill of joy at seeing him for the first time after her long separation. A lightness of spirit when they shared laughter. A thrum of excitement when he kissed her hand. And the soft glow of warmth that sharing his company brought her. Those feelings were real. She sighed. They just weren't for a real person. Beth feared Hillary would find that unsettling, even creepy. But Beth just wanted to hold tight to those feelings, because letting them go... Letting them go felt wrong. Chapter 10 Edward rolled over onto his side. His mattress was lumpy, his pillow hard, and the room too cold. Yet his bed and pillow were the same as yesterday, his room warmed by a fire, and his evening routine was unchanged. Elizabeth. She was the cause. She'd disappeared a week previous and hadn't returned, and her disappearance had weighed on his mind. He shouldn't have become involved. His friends, what few remained after his wife's passing, would believe him insane, or Elizabeth a visitor from the spirit realm. But he knew her to be no spirit. She interacted with not only him, but also his acquaintances. That should be sufficient evidence that she was of this world— she had no more propelled herself into the past than he had pulled her. Her confusion and dismay aside, she couldn't even remember his name, additional evidence of her innocence in the events that had unraveled thus far. Why return to a past with a man she didn't remember? Although that wasn't strictly correct, she had some memory, but not of his name. Edward fell asleep, puzzling over the conundrum of Elizabeth's incomplete memory and time travel accomplished without the aid of a Wellsian time machine. When he awoke, Edward rested on a refreshingly comfortable settee. The cushions were most extraordinary, more like a bed than a settee. His fascination with the cushions disappeared the moment he realized he had no memory of waking, leaving his bed, or dressing. He looked around the room and recognized nothing. He'd woken in an informal parlor, the objects inside familiar but touched by strangeness. Oddly shaped furniture, a crisp painting housed behind flawless glass, a photo in startling color. Where was he? He swung his legs off the settee and onto the floor. As he did so, he noticed that even his clothing looked and felt wrong. The strange fabric, his bare arms— the general indecency of his costume boggled the mind. A tremendous rumble echoed through the room, drawing his attention to another wonder, a huge window with glass so fine it appeared to be air. 
Too late, he stood before the window, staring out into a street where little appeared to be moving, and certainly nothing that would make that raucous noise. Houses with tiny, plain gardens lined up in a row of sameness looked back at him. As his mind struggled with the significance of the alien homes, a box sped down the street. He took an involuntary step back from the window. Heart thudding in his chest, he turned back to the settee. The photo. Edward returned to the small table next to the settee and picked it up. A moment in time captured, full of color and life. A photograph, but so different from those hanging on the wall in his own home. The photo showed a young woman with a tidy, almost severe appearance, standing close to an older man in an oddly tailored suit, and an older woman displaying a good expanse of bare leg. But these were merely passing thoughts. The young woman held his attention. Elizabeth. A younger, less feminine version of the woman he'd come to know. But there was no doubt that the woman in the photograph was his Elizabeth. She was covered from shoulder to toe in a long, black, bulky garment, similar to the robes of a university student. He knew it. He'd traveled into the future, to Elizabeth's world. He thought back. 2016, she'd said. He replaced the photograph gently on the table. Perhaps he hadn't, strictly speaking, known. On some level, however, he'd felt a spark of awareness when he'd awoken in such a strange place but it had taken time for him to sift through the various differences. Adjustment aside, it was disorienting being inside an unknown building in an unknown town. Perhaps he should have a look outside. He got so far as unlocking and opening the front door, but before he could exit, his gaze fell upon a woman across the street leaving her home. She lifted her hand and waved excitedly at him. Edward reciprocated the gesture in a more subdued manner before retreating back inside the house. He had no understanding of this society. Perhaps it was no surprise that a gentleman exited Elizabeth's home, or perhaps he had created some unintended difficulty for her. A crack pierced the air, followed by the rumble of another motor wagon, not quite so fast, not quite so shiny, but still startling in its foreignness. The door thudded shut after him with more force than he'd intended. Edward knew exactly what the speeding metal boxes were. He'd seen a motor wagon before. He'd even ridden in one, though they were hardly common. But the leap from the open-air carriage of his own time to the box-like speed demon of this one. One traveled at a brisk pace, but the other raced down the street as fast as a galloping horse. He rubbed his eyes. Or, like a machine from the future. Common sense said that science would move forward. If he considered all that had been accomplished in his own lifetime, it was no surprise that the motor wagon of Elizabeth's time, more than a hundred years after his own, was hardly recognizable. He only hoped that the scientists of this era had also resolved any ill effects traveling at such high speeds might have upon the body. Goose flesh pimpled his arms at the thought of his internal organs sloshing about at high speed. But when he rubbed his bare arms, he was again reminded of the oddity of his attire. He touched the denim material of his trousers. Elizabeth had appeared in his time appropriately clothed, so it was reasonable to assume that his attire suited the period. No jacket, only an undershirt, workman's trousers. Styles had certainly changed, unfavorably by his estimation. The shoes, however, were comfortable. He balanced on his toes and then rocked back on his heels. Quite comfortable. The stillness of the house should have been immediately obvious, but he'd been distracted. He became suddenly and acutely aware of the silence, and that he was in Elizabeth's home. Perhaps the initial shock of hurtling through time was wearing off. He looked around the parlor. There was an intimacy to standing here, now that he knew it was her parlor. He couldn't bring himself to venture further into the house and possibly violate her privacy. Since he couldn't leave the house and wouldn't invade her home further, he had one remaining choice. He would wait. Chapter 11 Beth pulled into her driveway, put her car in park, and turned the radio off. Collecting her thoughts after a client appointment was part of her process. She usually took a few minutes to replay the appointment and mentally compile the main points of the meeting. Except today she couldn't focus on the bigger picture. Her attention span was shorter than normal, and a general sense of impatience, like she'd had two cups of coffee too many, made her fidgety. She smacked the side of the steering wheel in annoyance, then gave up and headed into the house. 
As she pulled her keys out, she considered her bribe options. If she could just finish typing up her notes, drafting goals, and sending a follow-up email to her new client, then a bubble bath? A glass of wine? Both. Definitely both. It was that kind of day. She turned the key in the lock, but there was no resistance and no corresponding click of the bolt sliding. She must have stared in confusion at the already unlocked door for several seconds, because it was impossible. She always locked her door. Only after she'd stepped into her entryway did it occur to her that maybe if she was that certain she'd locked her door, she shouldn't have walked into the house. Maybe she should have stayed outside and called 911. She fumbled in her purse for her phone as she turned back to the door. Elizabeth, a man's voice called. Beth froze. No one called her Elizabeth, not even her parents. Oh! Surprise made her voice squeak, because there was one person who called her Elizabeth, but that wasn't possible because he was a dream. She turned. Tall, clean-shaven, wearing jeans and a fitted T-shirt, her mystery man was less than fifteen feet away and closing the gap. Two worlds collided— or maybe the tilting floor and wobbly walls had something to do with whatever had created her hallucination. But then she had a moment of clarity, as if all the pieces of a complex puzzle suddenly snapped into place. Edward. A wide smile spread across his face. You remember. He stopped a few feet in front of her, looked down, and touched the neck of his shirt. I have some understanding now of how uncomfortable you might have been when you arrived in my world. He was close enough to touch. Her hand hovered, halted midair as she reached out to touch his arm. He wasn't real. He was supposed to be a dream. Slowly, he reached out and grasped the tips of her fingers and gently squeezed. I am real. Beth didn't feel relief that he'd proven himself a tangible presence rather than a figment of her imagination. She was too distracted by the feel of his hand on hers. Victorian men and women wore gloves. She'd never felt his hand touch her own. It was a silly little thing, but standing in her entryway, her fingers clasped by a man well over a hundred years old, that was the thought that kept her frozen in place. Chapter 12 Beth couldn't seem to move, and she didn't know what to say. Edward Stanbury the name popped into her head. Edward Stanbury was here, in her hallway, in 2016. Elizabeth? Edward let go of her hand, but he ducked his head and tried to catch her gaze. Beth? He never called her Beth. She remembered that, and so much more. How long have you been here? An hour, perhaps two? He pressed his lips together. A lady across the way saw me when I opened the front door. Beth nodded. It's confusing, appearing in an unknown place with no sense of time or location. I'm sure you wanted to check out everything. But even as she spoke, only part of her was engaged with the conversation. She couldn't move beyond the fact of his presence in her world. It took her several seconds to realize he was uncomfortable with having been seen in her home. Oh, no, it's no problem. If my neighbors see you, I mean, that's fine. It's not a problem. In this time, it's fine. She shook her head. She was babbling, and she did not babble. She took a deep breath, counted to three as she exhaled, and then said, Would you like a drink? Yes, thank you. If you'd like to join me in the kitchen, I can make tea. She should have a small quantity stashed in the back of a cupboard. Not like she'd had much interest in tea prior to... Yesterday? The day before yesterday? Edward followed her through to the kitchen and took a seat. I haven't had tea in the kitchen since I was a little boy. He watched while she prepared the tea and asked, Can I help? No, it'll be just a minute. Beth took those few minutes of puttering around the kitchen to collect her thoughts. Edward was here, in her house. She kept trying to wrap her mind around that fact. And then there was the question of her instant recall. It was as if his presence had triggered an unveiling of hidden memories. All of the conversations, the time spent together that she'd believed a dream, firmed, and the holes started to fill. While previously some parts had seemed real and others confusing and vague, now it was all vividly etched in her mind. 
as if Edward's presence in this world, in her world, made Edward himself real. Completely, totally irrational. I agree. Edward's voice startled her and she turned abruptly to face him. He started to stand, but she shooed him back into his chair. Once he was seated again, he said, My presence here, yours and my time, it is difficult to comprehend. As she prepared Edward's tea, one sugar and no milk, she realized that not only was she certain of his preference, she remembered preparing tea for him on several occasions. She handed him the cup. How is it possible that my memories span several meetings, but two days ago I didn't even know you existed? I've traveled into the future over a hundred years, witnessed the offspring of my era's motor wagon, seen a photograph that captures life, and I'm wearing clothing that appeared from the ether. My darling lady, our experiences lie well outside the bounds of any reality I have thus far experienced. Divine or mortal intervention? Chance? Edward lifted the cup to his mouth and sipped. He seemed to be considering his next words. Though I'm uncertain how this is all possible, I can't deny it's happening. And knowing you, I wouldn't have it otherwise. Beth wasn't a weepy type of person, not prone to rapidly shifting moods and usually quite practical. But Edward's words produced an unfamiliar and very sudden wash of emotion. Her breath hitched and caught in her throat. Bizarre as their experience was, Edward seemed to have no regrets. Well, she didn't either. Beth didn't have the right words to reply, so she let the moment pass. And besides, even if she might be falling for the man sitting across the table from her, there couldn't possibly be a future for them. She didn't know when he would suddenly fade away and return to the past. All she knew for sure was that he would leave because he didn't belong in 2016 any more than she belonged in 1899. She loosened her grip on the teacup clasped too tightly in her fingers and tried to think of something, anything to say. Would you like to take a walk? As the question left her lips, she realized it was a great start. What better way for Edward to acclimate to the present than to view it in a low-pressure environment, with few critical or close observers on hand but the opportunity to watch the world go by? And her neighborhood was quiet. We can stay in my neighborhood, and you can see the people, the cars, motor wagons are called cars, and what the world looks like in this little corner of 2016. Edward finished his tea and nodded. That sounds lovely. It is unsettling not knowing what takes place outside these walls. I'm attired appropriately for such an outing. Beth smiled. She remembered asking him the same question the first time they'd ventured out in public in his world. Yes. However this time-leaping works, there seems to be a hand with a practical touch at work. A thought occurred. It's much hotter here. With both the warm climate and a more casual social environment— Sometimes people don't wear much, and that's normal. I understand. I'll be fine. Beth gave him a worried look. If I promise not to swoon at the sight of bare legs, will you stop worrying? He asked. Sorry. But Beth couldn't shake the thought that she'd have a hard time with some of the joggers attire in her neighborhood if she were a Victorian. As she gathered up the dishes and placed them in the sink, she couldn't remember when she'd last felt this nervous or this shy. Her previous encounters with Edward had been different. She didn't remember her stomach fluttering or her hands sweating. She remembered finding him attractive, and surprisingly, he was even more so when viewed within the context of modern clothing and her kitchen. But her feelings before had been more detached. She just couldn't get over the fact that he was here— it was so incredibly real now. A touch on her elbow made her jump. Sorry. The apology was accompanied by a crooked smile. If you're uncomfortable. No, uh, it's just, it's very different having you here in my home. When Beth saw his eyes start to narrow in what looked like consternation, she realized how that must sound. She gave him her best effort at a genuine smile. I'm happy you're here. I just don't understand how or why. I know you didn't choose to land in my house any more than I chose to land in your garden. But you're very welcome here, always. 
I can't say it wasn't a surprise, albeit a pleasant one, to find myself in your time in your home. Beth leaned a hip against the counter and looked at him, really looked at him. I worry about where this ends, about why it's happening, if there's some greater purpose that we're missing. And what she would do if she fell completely head over heels for him and then he faded away one day and just didn't come back. But that was an admission that was difficult enough to make silently. She couldn't bring herself to voice it, so she asked, Don't you worry? But we don't have those answers, not yet. And until we do, I hope that you can enjoy the time we have. This last month has allowed me to rediscover the joy that can be found in each day, in simple activities like picnics, in a sunny day spent in the company of a delightful companion. Edward's gaze drifted, as if his thoughts were suddenly far away. Several seconds later, his gaze again sharp, he said, I'd forgotten that. And your generosity of spirit, your joy in life, helped me to remember. Beth blinked. Her joy in life. She didn't see herself that way, but that was just fine that Edward did, and she wasn't about to contradict him. Excellent advice. Let's enjoy the moment. Beth grabbed her house keys from the hook near the front door. As she walked through the door, she said over her shoulder, And just a heads up, you're in Texas. Sunny days aren't so scarce as in England. You're looking at a lot of joy if sunny days are the key. Edward tipped his head. In fact, it's more about the company than the weather. But I look forward to many sunny days in good company. Beth couldn't help an answering grin. Chapter 13 Edward closed the front door behind him and, reaching his hand out for Elizabeth's keys, asked, May I? She handed him a weighty key fob with at least half a dozen small keys attached. It's the pink one. Sure enough, one of the odd-shaped keys was pink, with a caricature of what he thought might be a cat. As he locked the front door, he couldn't help but admire the smooth slide of the sophisticated-looking mechanism. He offered the keys to Elizabeth. Actually, do you mind? I don't have any pockets. No, of course not. Only after he'd agreed did Edward realize he wasn't entirely certain that he had pockets. After a quick and discreet inspection, he found that his pants were indeed equipped with pockets of sufficient size to hold the keys. We'll just stay on the sidewalk. That should be safe enough. Edward scanned the area, looking for lurking dangers, but all he saw were tidy, well-maintained homes, one after the other. He nodded in acknowledgment of a passing man's casual two-fingered wave. Wires hung from the man's ears, and he appeared to be wearing half of his underclothes and nothing else as he ran down the street, but Elizabeth appeared unconcerned, and not responding would be rude. Is there some particular danger of which I should be aware? Elizabeth laughed and shook her head. No. The skin around her eyes crinkled with mirth. You may be wearing different clothes, but you're exactly as I remember. I'm not certain I understand the source of your amusement, but I hope it's a reflection of the positive impression I made upon you in your dreams. You're kind, you're considerate, but you're also so much more open-minded than I would have guessed someone from your era to be. She winced, then bit her lip. I'm sorry. The Victorians weren't known for being particularly forward-thinking about women. She paused to gesture at her clothing, a rather finely tailored suit complete with jacket and trousers. And a hop into the future has to be a shock, more so than a trip to the past. And yet... Edward smiled politely at yet another running person and stepped to the side to allow room for the pram she was pushing. He could feel his eyes widening at the snugness of the woman's ensemble. How did the material fit so closely? She might as well be unclothed. He turned back to Elizabeth. Apologies, you were saying? A huge grin spread across her face. I was saying that it's cool how well you're taking all of this. Cool? Admirable. You don't seem worried about the changes that have taken place over the last hundred years. Edward wasn't sure how to respond, because in many ways it didn't seem all that different to him. Faster, bigger, louder, but essentially... As if on cue, a loud noise overhead interrupted him. He turned his head skyward. Now that, that is different. 
That's a helicopter. It belongs to the police, a professional organization that handles law enforcement for the city. Edward swallowed a laugh. We have police. He looked back up at the sky. But we certainly don't have those. Oh, sorry. I thought professional policing wasn't that old. I mean... Elizabeth's nose and cheeks flushed a pale shade of pink. I know what you mean. He watched the machine move through the sky until it was no more than a speck. What's it called again? Helicopter. Fascinating. But outside of the fact that man has conquered flight, much of what I've seen thus far is similar. Cleaner, bigger, louder, but more similar than, say, a hundred years prior to my own time. It may not seem like it to a woman from this age, but Edward lived in a time of innovation and change. He had only to open the daily paper to learn of some new advancement in industry or a scientific discovery. At least my society has imagined the concept of a flying vehicle. But it's so different. Everything has changed. Her lips twisted. You're looking for the elements that unite the times. Given the circumstances, that's pretty amazing. I can tell you that wasn't my first reaction. Edward didn't see her point. They turned onto a slightly busier street with more motor wagon, car, traffic. It's not so very different. Not what I've seen so far. Faster vehicles driving on the wrong side of the road. More sophisticated locks with smaller keys, different clothing. He paused as he considered the accuracy of that statement. Less clothing. But neighbors still greet each other in the street, and transport still carries travelers through the city. He glanced up at the bluest sky he'd ever seen. Or above it. Well, I'm glad. There are some things that are more radically different, but we can chat about those before you run into them. Elizabeth shook her head. You're just so much better at this than I was. And I had the comfort of a somewhat familiar past, and the illusion of believing it all to be a dream. Tiny wrinkles appeared on her forehead. At first, I know this is no dream. He wanted to tell her that he'd never doubted, not when she'd faded into view the first time he'd met her, and not when he'd appeared in her parlor. But he hesitated to be so blunt. I don't know what's happening, but this is no dream. They were approaching an intersection with another residential street. From what he could tell, the community appeared to be laid out on a grid. He glanced at the street sign. A woman's name, both first and last. It seemed an odd choice for a residential neighborhood. Why? A shrill tone interrupted him. Elizabeth pulled out an object approximately the size of her hand. Apparently, she had at least one pocket. Indecision briefly crossed her face, then she touched the shiny surface of the item. The noise stopped. Sorry, I'll explain in a minute. He nodded, though he wasn't certain what would be explained. Elizabeth turned away from him and spoke into the box. Hey, can't talk right now, but everything's fine. I'll give you a call this evening. I promise. He was listening to one side of a conversation. A telephone conversation. A telephone the size of his palm. With no wires. Outdoors. Once the device had disappeared into her pocket, he said, That item is a telephone. Before she answered, Elizabeth's eyes narrowed and she winced. Yes? Edward composed his features. If there was time travel, then what was a miniature phone in the grander scheme? A portable telephone. I see. She looked up at him, clearly trying to gauge his reaction. Okay, good. It's a little more complicated than that, but basically a portable phone. I'll show you a little more about how it works when we get back to the house. Her face was tipped up and he got his first clear look at her eyes since he'd arrived. Cornflower blue, which he knew, but also outlined with the most exotic dark lines and thick black lashes. Her head tilted and he realized he'd leaned closer. Her eyes widened and she said, You're blushing. You are. It's the makeup, isn't it? Her nose scrunched up. Not really the thing back in the day, I know. No, that is... It's very attractive. It makes your eyes look strikingly blue. The smile she gave him was new. Not her brashly amused smile or her mischievous grin. This was a shy, modest smile, and it made his heart warm. He'd missed this, the small intimacies of paying an attractive woman a genuine compliment. 
sharing a private moment as the world continued to bustle with life around them, feeling something. There was a kernel here, the beginning of more. If he didn't fade away and never come back, the thought unsettled him for the first time since this outrageous journey had begun for one simple reason. Until now, he'd refused to look into the future. He'd lived in each moment, happy for her company. The possibility of a future spent in the company of Elizabeth, that future called to him. Under the circumstances, after everything he'd lost, and how improbable a future between a man and a woman from different times must certainly be, that hope frightened him. Chapter 14 Edward's visit had been lovely. Beth had played hooky from work. Easy enough, since she was her own boss, and she'd only had the one client appointment scheduled for the day. Explaining cell phones, the internet, and email had turned out to be fun. Edward was unshockable, and surprisingly, more fascinated by air conditioning and the various gadgets in the kitchen than her smartphone. Although in retrospect, the full functionality of her phone, of the internet, probably hadn't quite sunk in. You're smiling again. Edward cut a tidy bite of pizza from the slice on his plate and popped it into his mouth. He seemed to be enjoying their impromptu late lunch. I'm happy. It's been a long time. Beth leaned forward and squinted. I think... Are you okay? But she was speaking to an empty chair. Right in front of her, he'd faded away. His substantial form turned first transparent, then wispy, and then he was gone. Her eyes started to burn and turned damp. Where were these tears coming from? According to Edward, she'd faded in and out of existence back in 1899. His departure hadn't been so different. And suddenly her mind caught up with her heart, and she couldn't breathe. Of course it was different. If Edward wasn't here with her, he was dead. The single trickling tear turned into a hiccuped stream of salty, sticky, wet mess. She splashed some cold water on her burning eyes and tried to convince herself that time was not, in fact, linear, even though it must be, and that Edward's absence did not equal his death, although surely it did. Her phone rang, saving her from her own questionable logic. She knew who it must be, but double-checked before she answered. Hey, who? You were supposed to call? Hillary's injured tone just made Beth shake her head. She wiped her face, carefully dabbing away the smudged mascara under her eyes, and then blew her nose on a paper towel before she replied. I've been busy. Yeah, getting sick. You sound all stuffy and hoarse. What do you think, a cold or allergies? A three-second lag passed, then... No way! You never cry! Why are you crying? What's happened? Hillary's voice got softer with each question, and Beth had to strain to hear the last few words. Remember the guy? From your dreams, of course. How could I forget? You never have naughty dreams. Hill, I wouldn't call my dreams naughty, just... Beth wasn't sure what she'd call her dreams, because they'd been real, and she couldn't tell Hillary that. A delicious single man who has the body of a god, that's what I remember. Ryan Reynolds, I said a similar build to Ryan Reynolds. Hillary made an exasperated noise. Same difference. So, why are you crying? I can't say. You'll think I'm nuts. Beth sniffed and dabbed at her nose. Seriously. Hillary sighed. What did you say when I dated that death metal rock star with the really bad hair and the worst clothes and 20 ex-girlfriends? Have fun. That's right, Hillary said. And when he dumped me for an 18-year-old model, you let me cry on your shoulder and never once said I told you so. And when I thought my grandpa's house was haunted? Have a handyman come out, and if he doesn't find anything, try an exorcist or a... What was it? A cleansing? Beth couldn't help a giggle. You might laugh now, but I called a local psychic to come and check it out when Grandpa was out. She didn't find anything, and the inspector I had come out found rats, but that's not the point. At the time, you didn't once make fun. Right, I get it. You'll support me no matter how loony, sorry, out of the box I sound. This whole thing is crazy. 
You've always had a higher tolerance for the weird and wondrous. I'm not sure how this happened to me. Beth thumped the kitchen counter because suddenly she did know. I cannot believe this. It's that Glenda Good. It's her fault. This all started with the journal and she practically begged me to buy it. Huh. That's not exactly what I remember you telling me. But okay. Huh. This is about those dreams, isn't it? Beth closed her eyes and dove right in. They weren't dreams. I traveled to 1899 and Edward just popped into the future for a little visit. That's why I couldn't talk before Edward and I were taking a walk through the neighborhood. She had to catch her breath because she'd spat out that entire explanation on one breath. A funny combination of groan and growl was Hillary's only response. What? Just say it. I'm hallucinating. Beth dabbed at the corner of her right eye. At least she'd stopped crying. Let's leave that for now. Assuming that time travel is possible, and I'm sure weirder things have happened somewhere to someone, a gorgeous man, who you clearly have feelings for, travels a hundred years, and you take him for a walk? What is wrong with you? Beth headed to the hall bathroom. Walks are nice. It's a chance to talk without staring awkwardly at another person across a table for an hour. And we had lunch. After she flipped on the bathroom light, she peered at her reflection in the mirror. Not too bad. Just red enough to be blamed on allergies. She could not look teary. Um, Beth, you still there? Yep. Beth dug around in the drawer for a spare compact she kept stashed for emergencies. This was an emergency, or armor for battle. I don't suppose you noticed the coincidence... Hillary paused as if Beth could read her mind. No, no idea what you mean. Hillary snorted. Glenda Good, doesn't that bring to mind, you know, witches and magic and, well, witches and magic? I have no idea. Beth's hand closed around the compact and she glared at her image in the mirror. After a quick dusting, her nose looked only faintly pink. But that woman is going to explain why she so badly wanted me to buy the journal. She's going to explain how this all happened, because she's in it up to her neck. I guess angry is better than crying. Hillary didn't sound convinced. Uh, why were you crying? Because Edwards disappeared, and if he really is time-traveling from 1899, that means that right now he's dead. Beth stumbled over the word dead. He's dead, and it's her fault. I don't know how, but it is, and she's going to make it right. Sweetheart, you don't sound at all like yourself. You know that doesn't make any sense, right? Yep. Beth hung up on her friend and grabbed her keys. She had an appointment with a witch. Chapter 15 Miss Good isn't here. Beth had worked up a good head of steam and was ready to confront the woman who had killed Edward. She knew Glenda hadn't actually caused Edward's death, but that was what it felt like, and now the target of her anger appeared to be M.I.A. She couldn't be hearing the salesperson correctly. I'm sorry, what? Ms. Good is out for the day. The young woman with silvery purple hair and flawless skin looked unruffled by Beth's ire. She could feel her skin turning all kinds of unattractive shades of red, but she clung to that frustrated anger. If she let it go, let herself rationalize her way through the events of the last few days, the cooler and calmer version of herself would never be able to voice the ludicrous accusations that churned inside her head. Time travel, magic, witches. Ludicrous was generous. Pinching her lips together in the most controlled voice she could manage, because yelling wouldn't help, she said, This is an emergency. Finely shaped eyebrows arched up in disbelief, but the saleswoman said, Leave your contact information, and I'll make sure Ms. Good receives it. If Beth wasn't so mad, she'd probably laugh. Who'd ever heard of a vintage clothing emergency, or a desperate need for an antique item? Actually, Hillary could likely construct a good argument for both of those scenarios, but that was Hillary. 
imagining Hillary and vintage emergencies removed Beth from the moment long enough that some small amount of reason started to leak in. She probably should take it down a notch if she actually wanted Glenda to receive her message. Yes, thank you. That would be very helpful. And it is very important, so I appreciate your help. Beth knew her face was still flushed, but she thought she'd managed a much more reasonable tone. One gorgeous eyebrow arched, but the saleswoman nodded and smiled, pen in hand. Right, call Beth as soon as possible. Beth recited her number, but then realized Glenda may have no idea who Beth was, so she quickly added, There's a problem with the journal I purchased a few days ago, the Victorian journal with the brown leather cover. The saleswoman's pen stopped and hovered over the page. We have a very generous return policy. I'm sure I can help you. No, um, no, I don't want to return it. Can you just pass along the message? Of course. The saleswoman repeated back Beth's number and scribbled a few more words down on the page. Is there anything else I can help you with? Beth cut short a hysterical giggle. Who knew what result the purchase of a brooch, pillbox hat, or old piece of china would have? She mumbled a refusal before hustling out of the store. As Beth walked the two blocks to her car, she tried to pound some sense into her normally very practical head. What if she had confronted Glenda with her suspicions? What could the woman say? If she was a witch, she'd never admit it. And really, what were the chances the owner of a moderately successful shop had anything to do with the events of the last several days? And what were the chances that witches actually existed? Something strange was happening, but for all she knew it was more back to the future than spells and magic. The Victorian journal could be a coincidence. Other than selling Beth something from the shop, which was the woman's job and one she was clearly good at, Glenda hadn't done anything. But Glenda Good and her little vintage boutique store were Beth's only leads. Really, the store and owner were just one lead, and it had fallen miserably flat. When she reached her car, she wanted to sink into the pavement rather than drive home because she didn't know what else to do. As she settled into her car, inspiration struck. She picked up her phone and dialed Hillary. I need the name of your psychic. Hello to you, too. Wait, why do you need my psychic? I thought you didn't believe in psychics. Oh, wait, time travel is real, so now you think I'm not totally batty. I'm not sure if I should be offended. Beth tapped her steering wheel impatiently. She really needed a manicure. About another five seconds, and... Who am I kidding? Hillary said. I'd love for you to meet Mary Margaret. You'll love her. Your psychic's name is Mary Margaret? Darn straight. She's brilliant. Don't let the suburban housewife act fool you. I'll text you her details, and I'll give her a call to let her know you're a friend and it's an emergency. I'm sure she'll fit you in if she can. Thanks, Hillary. Beth wrapped her fingers around the steering wheel and squeezed. She was, quite simply, so far out of her depth that visiting a psychic seemed almost normal. It's just that I don't know what else to do. Silence followed Beth's admission. Eventually, Hillary, her voice quieter and without its typical hard edges, whispered, I know, sweetheart. Beth hung up before she got emotional and teary again. Once in a day was more than enough. Beth flipped the visor mirror open, a little pale and glassy-eyed, but otherwise normal enough. And yet her life had veered from its heavily trod, oh-so-normal path once more, because she was about to visit a psychic. Her phone beeped at her with a message. She must have stared at her reflection longer than she'd realized. Not only had Hillary sent her contact details, she'd also set up an appointment for 20 minutes from now. Mary Margaret, here I come. Chapter 16 The neighborhood wasn't at all what Beth had expected. Residential, not commercial, and very quiet. Not quite the suburbs, not quite in town, the house was in a small, older neighborhood tucked away from the bustle of major roadways, but still deceptively close to the heart of the city. Her GPS told her she'd arrived, but that couldn't be. No sign advertised tarot or readings. The house was painted an appealing shade of gray with contrasting black trim and shutters. Beth grinned. The door, however, was a shockingly bright pinkish red in comparison like the owner had taken the traditional look and thumbed her nose at it, but only a little. Maybe this was the right place. 
She parked at the curb and approached the house. Unable to shake the thought that maybe she'd made a mistake with the address, even though she'd triple-checked it, she hesitated to knock on the door. She'd finally lifted her hand when the door swung open to reveal a small, trim woman, maybe mid-fifties, with a cutely upturned nose, dressed in tennis clothes. I can drape myself with a kitchen tablecloth and we can pretend they're mystical robes if that makes you feel more comfortable. Embarrassed, Beth wiped the astonishment from her face and replied, I apologize. I'm not sure about robes, but maybe I expected something else. No problem. The tennis-playing psychic extended her right hand. I'm Mary Margaret, and you must be Beth. After they shook hands, Mary Margaret invited Beth inside. I've got to run right after our meeting to make a tennis match with a friend, hence the get-up. I appreciate you making time. Beth followed Mary Margaret into the kitchen and accepted the offered seat at the table. You helped Hillary with her grandfather's home? Ah, the suspected haunting. Tea? When Beth nodded, Mary Margaret retrieved two cups with matching saucers from a cupboard. No, I don't do ghosts, and that was before Hillary was a client of mine. I have mixed feelings about her choice, but her expert didn't find anything. No, ghosts are outside my skill set. I primarily read auras. Mary Margaret spent a few minutes preparing the tea, and Beth watched her, baffled. Auras? Her host placed shortbread cookies, Beth's favorite, and the tea things on the table. First the door, then the cookies. Can you read minds or predict the future? Beth asked as Mary Margaret settled into her seat across the table. No, nothing like that. I can see some of the light, the energy, honestly, I'm not sure what it is, that surrounds most people. And I have a knack for interpreting it. Sometimes my intuition is especially good, but that's all. I can show you if you like. So you haven't already checked out my... Aura works as well as any other word. A faint look of distaste crossed Mary Margaret's face. Peering at someone's aura without their permission feels like an intrusion. If you had x-ray vision, I'd hope you'd choose not to peer through the walls of my house even if you could. So over the years, I've developed a willful blindness, basically a filter. That saying about fences and neighbors applies in the metaphysical world as well. And that's when Beth's comfort level increased exponentially. She could see why Hillary was such a fan. Did Hillary tell you anything about my problem? I have... Mary Margaret held up a hand. I'd rather just let you know what I see, then we can chat about what it might mean, and you can fill me in on any background you think is important. Is that okay? Beth nodded. A brushing sensation, much like the slide of soft material over bare skin, passed over her hands and arms. It wasn't sexual, but there was an intimacy to it that made Beth uncomfortable. And if she hadn't expected it, she could imagine the feeling being frightening. When she looked at Mary Margaret to gauge her response, a tight expression covered her face. Beth hoped that look reflected concentration and not concern over what she saw. You're covered in someone else's signature. Mary Margaret's tight expression had turned into a definite frown. Some people have a hint of magic, and the thin veil covering you has the flavor of magic. Beth gritted her teeth. Yep, that makes sense. I don't suppose you could tell me whose magic it is? Not unless I've met the person and read his or her aura, and then only maybe. But I doubt I've ever read the aura of someone with enough magic to do this. I can't know, but I suspect it would take a very strong magical ability to leave their own signature on top of yours. Mary Margaret took a sip of tea. Do you have any ideas who might be responsible? Oh, yes, but no proof. Is there anything else, or do you want the story now? Let's see. Mary Margaret leaned forward and rested her forearms on the edge of the kitchen table. Romance. Any chance there's been a tall, dark stranger in your life? She must have read something on Beth's face because her eyes widened. Actually, I was teasing about the tall and dark, but there is a tall, dark stranger, isn't there? There is. His name is Edward, and he's not quite so cliched as he sounds. An image of Edward, solid, comforting, thoughtful, flashed through her mind. 
Okay, maybe he is a little cliched, but only in the best possible ways. You're in love. Was she? Love was such a big word, and she hadn't known Edward long at all, had she? But she had memories that were greater by far than the few days that had passed since she'd first traveled back in time. If she pushed past the circumstances and looked at how she felt, well, she'd lost her bananas and acted completely out of character when he disappeared. She'd bawled, gotten angry, practically threatened some witch by proxy. Or maybe she'd been incredibly rude to an innocent shop owner's employee. That part wasn't quite clear. Regardless, she hadn't acted like herself at all. Maybe just a little bit. Mary Margaret gave her an encouraging smile. Is that so very bad? I think it might be. We don't share the same world. Literally. I mean, he's from the past. I'm from the present. Mary Margaret's eyes widened. Oh, that's problematic. And that touch of magic I saw makes a lot more sense. Did you see anything else? I mean, besides the magic and romance? I don't actually see romance, per se. It's more a sense of warmth and heightened emotions. Mary Margaret nibbled delicately on a cookie. And it seemed romantic. It's not exact what I do. More general impressions than specific pieces of information. A handbook would be helpful, but I don't know anyone else who sees exactly what I see. A few of my contacts see auras, but we all experience them differently. She shrugged. So I'm stuck with a combination of impressions and past experience with clients. It sounds frustrating. Beth wasn't so sure she wouldn't have permanently filtered out people's auras, maybe even willfully forgotten her ability if she had a similar talent. Yes, but I like helping people when I can. You asked what else I saw? Nothing obvious or clear. People are complex and we're all made up of so many moving pieces. With regular clients, I can see changes, but I don't have a baseline for you. A cloud fell across her face. I have seen darkness before, when another person's ill intent begins to muddy or darken a person's aura. If it makes you feel better, I don't see any signs of that. I suppose that's a relief but I can't help feeling that someone is interfering with my life. Normal people don't have flings with Victorians. Hmm. Beth couldn't miss Mary Margaret's clear desire to say more. Something held her back, oddly given the frank nature of their conversation thus far. Time travel was an acceptable topic for conversation, but not whatever Mary Margaret was omitting. Beth couldn't help but ask, What are you not saying? Maybe loving someone and a fling aren't the same. Beth narrowed her eyes. It was just an expression. An expression that is much more emotionally distancing than love. Mary Margaret took another small bite of cookie followed by a sip of tea. The smell of the strong black tea reminded Beth she hadn't drunk from her own cup in the last several minutes. She took a sip. Given the precarious nature of my relationship with Edward... Distancing myself doesn't sound like a terrible idea. Mary Margaret sighed. That's your choice, of course, but be aware that you're making the choice. Maybe this is an opportunity for love, maybe for heartbreak, but only if you choose to give Edward a chance. Or you can simply walk away. Maybe it was that simple. She could open up her heart for love or heartbreak, or she could walk away. I can't walk away. Beth's stomach churned at the thought. I can't. And she knew she couldn't. She hadn't enjoyed a man's company this much since, well, never. Not in the same way. And she could hardly deny the attraction. Which was funny because they hadn't even kissed. That last bit of advice had very little to do with your aura. Beth could feel her cheeks warm. She placed the backs of her hands on them. It's ridiculous. The man makes me blush. I can't remember the last time a man made me blush, maybe junior high? A mischievous grin spread across Mary Margaret's face. When he was alive, my husband could always make me blush. That's certainly not a bad sign. All right, any other questions? I hate to rush you out, but my tennis match awaits. Beth made her goodbyes, and when she tried to pay, found that Hillary had already taken care of it. 
Her visit had only lasted a half hour from start to finish, and Mary Margaret hadn't been at all what Beth had expected. Not a psychic, at least not as Beth understood them. Psychics saw the future or communed with the dead. Mary Margaret just saw what was in front of her, more clearly than most people and in ways Beth didn't understand, but looking closely, truly seeing, that was all she seemed to be doing. And Beth couldn't believe how much she'd helped. Yes, Hillary believed Beth's story, but Hillary was her best friend. Mary Margaret had not only believed without hesitation, she'd encouraged Beth to consider her feelings for Edward and to make a conscious choice. For the last few days, she'd let events take her where they would, and that had increased her sense of helplessness. It had also probably helped to fuel her anger. Beth climbed into her car, first her two realistic dreams, and then Edward appearing and solidifying her feelings and memories, and now both Hillary and Mary Margaret learning of her story. With each step, Beth saw her experiences with Edward and the possibility of a relationship as less impossible. The lingering mystery behind her travels and Edward's had been both clouding and hampering her feelings. Thanks to Mary Margaret, Beth had learned that someone with magic had likely engineered the trips, and maybe that meant the interfering magical busybody could get Edward back again. Beth needed to find Glenda, but maybe this time she could keep the anger in check. Mary Margaret had said that no ill intent clung to or had harmed her aura. If Glenda was responsible, and she didn't have an intent to harm Beth, then maybe she'd even want to help. Key in the ignition, Beth paused. She wanted her head straight before she left. She'd driven when she was upset earlier, and that simply wasn't safe. She closed her eyes and counted to ten. On ten, she let out an audible breath and opened her eyes, to find Edward sitting in the seat next to her. She didn't think, didn't plan, just leaned and Edward leaned. Then eyes met, but only briefly, because the next moment their lips touched. Chapter 17 Edward didn't experience the same sense of disorientation when he arrived in Beth's car as he had on his first visit to the future. Perhaps each trip would be easier, so long as there were future trips. But his thoughts soon deserted him, Elizabeth sat next to him with her eyes closed and her lips parted slightly. There was a certain intimacy to sharing such a small, enclosed space with a woman, and he didn't wish to startle her. But when her eyes opened, he saw no surprise. No, he knew that look. That look said, kiss me. So he did. Breaths exchanged, mouths touching, the slide of fingers through his hair. It had been too long since he'd last felt the touch of a woman's lips, a woman's hands on his body. But he was in a carriage. No, a motor wagon. No, a car. He pulled away, but only a fraction, one hand still cradling Beth's jaw. Beth's hand fell from his neck to his shoulder, the tips of her fingers gliding along bare skin, and then the thin cloth of his shirt. He cleared his throat. I feel I should apologize, but I cannot. Her eyes, closed since their lips had met, fluttered open. Slowly, a warm rose color spread across her cheeks. You definitely shouldn't apologize. Not a faux pas in 2016. First the blush, and now Elizabeth wouldn't meet his eyes. Kissing in cars might not break societal rules, but it certainly made his Beth uncomfortable. Waking in the future, Elizabeth's unexpected proximity and the kiss had occupied his thoughts fully. Only now did he realize Elizabeth wore the same clothes as when he'd departed. How long has it been since I was last here? Elizabeth turned her key and the car lit up. Electricity was everywhere in this world. He followed her gaze to a small clock. Numbers, rather than a clock face. About three hours? That's unusual, isn't it? Although I can't tell you how relieved I am, I was worried that he wouldn't return a concern he found increasingly more worrisome himself as he grew closer to Elizabeth. At least she shared that concern and apparently the attraction he'd been feeling, both excellent pieces in the puzzle of their developing relationship. Now, if only there was a way to ensure his continued travel to this time and place, to Elizabeth. Edward glanced down to find his own clothing unchanged. On each occasion that you joined me in my time, a minimum of one full day had passed usually more. What does that mean? Yes, an excellent question. 
Edward shifted in his seat. He seemed to have landed atop an item in Elizabeth's car. Can you wait one moment? He waited for a positive response before opening the door and exiting, because he could only imagine how potentially injurious stepping out of a moving car might be, given the speed at which they traveled. Nothing in the seat. He ran his hand along the crease and still found nothing. Ah, can you turn around? She was suppressing a grin, and Edward felt like he was missing something. As he rotated, he recalled his trouser pockets. He'd completely forgotten. He pulled out a leather wallet from his back pocket and lowered himself back into the car. We'll head back to my house for now, if that works. We can regroup there and order some food for dinner. She pulled away from the curb as she spoke. Certainly, he replied, but he was barely paying attention. A small, stiff card with his picture and name held his attention. How? He pulled it out and examined both the front and back. Whoa! Elizabeth pulled the car to the side of the road again and stopped. Let me see that. She snatched the small card from his hand and examined it closely. Can you hand me my purse? She waved a hand behind her but didn't look up. A large bag that in no way resembled a purse was behind her seat. He retrieved it in hopes it was the correct item. She glanced up just long enough to find the wallet where he'd placed it in between them. Picking it up, she began flipping through the contents. Oh my. Oh, if you hunt around in my purse, you should find a wallet. Eventually, she looked up, ready to receive the wallet. Her face had lost all color. You're concerned? She flipped open her own wallet and pulled out a similar plastic card. Glancing up, she said, I am. She compared the two similar cards for several seconds. What's your full name? Just as the card states, Edward Zephyrin Stanbury. Zephyrin? That doesn't sound very British. Her curiosity clearly was dampened by the revelation of the small cards. He nonetheless felt compelled to answer the unasked question. No, Zephyrin is the name of a distant cousin living in the Americas. A wealthy, distant cousin. He had no direct heir, and my parents were ever hopeful. She set both the cards down and smiled, clearly amused by his parents' blatant machinations. How did that work out? Quite nicely. He did, in fact, leave the entirety of his estate to myself and another cousin with equally enterprising parents. His response had the intended effect, and as Elizabeth laughed, the lines of worry faded away from her forehead. She replaced both of the cards and said, It's a license to drive, but also what's used in this country most commonly as identification. We'll have to sort out if it's real, or close enough to real to work. But we can do that later. She gave him a speculative look. You're not driving, anyway. Edward lifted both hands. I wouldn't presume. That hardly seems safe. She grinned at his response. My house and dinner. Lovely. He wasn't sure why Elizabeth found his response amusing. He didn't yet have the skills to drive. Why would he drive? As soon as he clicked the safety device across his shoulder, the car surged forward at a very fast pace and he discreetly clutched the armrest for the entirety of the trip. Chapter 18 There's a journal. The words slipped out as soon as Beth focused her attention on the road. Easier to admit having read a person's private thoughts when not looking them, him, in the eye. She wouldn't have mentioned it, but it was almost certainly part of the magical equation that had produced their time-traveling adventures. Her phone picked that moment to finally find a GPS signal and spat out directions in a crisp male British voice. Head north toward Smith Avenue. What is that? Edward asked. He sounded more alarmed by her navigation app than anything else he'd encountered. Beth could feel her ears turn pink as she pressed the mute button. She shouldn't be embarrassed that the voice spoke in a British accent, except she'd just changed it, and only after her first visit back in time. But Edward didn't know that. He didn't even know what GPS or mapping applications were. She cleared her throat. Directions to my home. I've never been to this particular place before, so the area is unfamiliar. If you don't find the disembodied voice unsettling, I presume its ability to convey directions verbally while your hands are otherwise occupied is convenient. Edward gave the phone a skeptical look. What were you saying about a journal? I only read the first few pages, and then... Beth swallowed. 
Each page had taken so long to decipher because of the faded ink, and she'd felt like a spy. As the car rolled to a stop, she glanced at Edward. But instead of showing any recognition of the journal, he was still eyeing the phone with suspicion. I muted it. I turned the sound off. I see. Beth held back a sigh. She should try again, shouldn't she? It took her another five minutes before she mustered the nerve. When she glanced at Edward to see if he might have already guessed where she was going with the journal question, she noticed him grasping tightly at the armrest. She slowed down to a few miles under the speed limit. Did you... do you keep a journal? I did, for a time. Writing each day provided an opportunity for activity at a time when I needed a distraction. He loosened his hold on the door and visibly relaxed his shoulders. One becomes accustomed to the quickly passing scenery, I presume? I would think so. You don't get motion sickness, do you? Beth hadn't even considered that possibility. How much more terrible was motion sickness in a speeding car versus a much slower carriage? She could only imagine. No, no. The speed is mind-boggling, that's all. Beth glanced at the speedometer. Forty-five miles per hour. Faster than the fastest horse. Luckily, she could easily enough skip freeways en route to her house. But forty-five is mind-boggling. We'll need to have a chat about interstate highways at some point. Edward nodded. Do you keep a journal? Darn, she'd almost managed to let the topic drift away. No, Beth said. I was asking because I've wondered, I'm sure you've wondered, how this all happened. And when I was speaking with a friend, Hillary, your friend who telephoned earlier, that's right, Hillary and I thought that perhaps a journal I recently purchased from a vintage shop might have something to do with it. Beth turned onto her street. Glancing at Edward again, she saw that he'd become very still. I can't fathom how a journal could aid in transporting a person through time. Regardless, you believe the journal might be mine. Edward looked out the car window as Beth pulled into the driveway. They'd arrived. I only ever had the one. I've never been a prolific writer, even to the point of eschewing lengthy correspondence. It's currently housed in a writing desk in my study. Beth pulled the key from the ignition and clutched it in her hand. I only read the first few pages, but once I realized, I didn't read further. If it is your journal, I'm sorry. If you stopped reading when you learned the journal was the writer's attempt to cope with the grief of losing a wife and unborn child, then there's little doubt that the journal is mine. Edward turned away from the window to look back at her. Looking at her hand, he said, You'll hurt yourself. Then he cupped her clenched fist in his hand. Slowly, she relaxed her fingers and he took the key. Perplexed, Beth looked at her hand and saw the angry red indentations made by the key's teeth. She rubbed the marks absently. She hadn't realized. Truly, it's not your fault, Edward said. Writings from earlier eras have historical value, and I'm surprised you would have considered the privacy of a man long dead. There was something... Beth couldn't remember exactly why she'd stopped. A connection, maybe? And I felt like I was intruding, but not because of the content. I didn't read... well... I didn't read that far. If you felt a connection, then perhaps there is some truth in the journal playing a part in our time traveling. Edward gave her a speculative look. You're certain you don't have some power, some technology that triggered our transport through time. Beth suppressed a grin. Cell phones and navigation apps were enough to convince him that time machines were a possibility. It was a little bit funny from a 21st century perspective. I'm sure. That's just as fanciful a concept today as it was during Queen Victoria's reign, I promise. But the brief flash of humor didn't last. His wife had died. His baby. It made her stomach hurt just thinking about it. I'm so, so sorry for your loss. It's been a few years, and it's long past time for me to move forward with my life. Honestly, Edward ducked his head. Effie would have been ashamed of the way I've behaved. Beth somehow doubted that the man sitting next to her could do anything truly shameful, and being paralyzed by grief was hardly something to censure oneself over. But what did Beth know? She hadn't known Effie, and she certainly had never lost a spouse. 
They passed several seconds in a silence eventually broken by Edward. Not to rush you, but is there a reason we're still sitting in your car in front of your house? Beth sighed and pointed at the car parked next to the curb. Hillary, that's her car, and she knows where I hide my spare key. She's inside, waiting to ambush me about the meeting I just had. But by now, she probably realizes we're out here and that you're with me. Beth couldn't miss the flutter of curtains in the front room. Oh, yes. The mad woman, waving in the window, is Hillary. Chapter 19 Beth tried to warn Edward, but describing a woman who could be anything from a whirling dervish to a force of nature in the time it took for them to reach the front door taxed her skills. As Hillary exited the front door, Beth finally settled on a partial truth and quickly said, Hillary is very enthusiastic. Edward smiled in greeting, but his expression turned unreadable as Hillary enveloped him in an embrace and said, You must be Edward. She gave him one final firm squeeze and let go. Beth knew exactly what her best friend was up to. Mention Ryan Reynolds and Hillary's common sense fled. Or maybe just her discretion. Hillary, this is Edward Stanbury. Edward, my enthusiastic friend Hillary. Come inside. Tell me everything. Hillary took Edward's arm and headed to the front door. Thanks, Hillary. I think we will go inside. My house. But Hillary had already walked inside, her head tilted close to Edward as she whispered goodness only knew what into Edward's ear. Beth squared her shoulders and followed behind the pair. Hillary had brought Edward back to the kitchen and was offering him a drink. He looked amused, so Hillary must not have said anything too terribly outrageous. No, thank you. Hillary poured a beer and offered it to Beth, but she declined. So, Hillary said as she sat down at the breakfast table, how are we going to keep you both in the same time and place? Preferably here and now, not London, 1890-whatever. Beth gave Hillary a hard-eyed look. She and Edward hadn't even come close to discussing that question. How like her best friend to brashly plow forward without considering the consequences. After she took a sip of beer, Hillary sighed dramatically. All right, then. How about discovering what caused this little rift in the space-time continuum? Then you might at least know if you can control it. Let's review the facts, she pointed at Beth. Go. Beth dropped into a chair because she knew Edward wouldn't make himself comfortable if she kept pacing the length of the kitchen. I met Glenda, proprietress of The Good Witch, and she offered me a fabulous deal on an old book. I declined. But you went back and... Hillary prompted. Right, Beth said. I went back, bought the book, read a page or two, and fell asleep. That's when the naughty dream started. Hillary gave Edward a significant look. A look that he ignored, gentleman that he was. Beth was beyond embarrassment, so she continued. I woke up, but couldn't remember everything, just certain parts. That never happened to you, did it? She asked Edward. You always had full recall of our meetings? Edward nodded. Absolutely. I was able to retain the full details of your visits, and yet you couldn't recall my name. Additionally, each visit I persuaded you to varying degrees— that the time we shared was more than a dream, but you returned with no memory of those conversations. That's so odd. I mean, let's be realistic. Time travel is crazy enough, but why this strange memory stuff? I don't get it. Hillary tapped a manicured nail against her half-empty beer glass. The tapping suddenly stopped and she lifted her finger. I've got it. Edward, you remember everything because it was your timeline, your reality. Beth was only visiting. Heck, for all we knew, she never actually left 2016. Maybe it was a dream. No, not a dream, but maybe it was less real to Beth because she was a visitor back in the Dark Ages. Edward raised his eyebrows at her comment, but more in amusement. Dark Ages aside, that doesn't account for my intact memory as I sit here in 2016. Also, there's this. He reached into his back pocket and pulled out his wallet. He'd barely pulled his license from his wallet when Hillary had snatched it away. After smoothing her fingertips over the surface and turning the license every which way, Hillary announced, Oh, this is real! Or an excellent fake. You're an expert in such matters. 
He accepted the license from her. Beth gave Hillary a reproving look. What? Hillary shrugged and turned to Edward. I've had a few fake IDs in my time. It's not the end of the world, and I was young. You wouldn't hold that against me, would you? Edward didn't hesitate in replying. Of course not, especially since it appears I may be in possession of a fake myself. Hillary smiled sweetly. Thank you, Edward. Spoken like a true gentleman. Although that license poses a whole new set of questions. Clinda better be the linchpin to this mystery. Otherwise... Otherwise, Edward would disappear. Not die, even though he would be dead if he didn't exist in the present. It wasn't really like he would be dying. Edward reached for Beth's hand and squeezed her fingers reassuringly. Are you well? Beth's phone rang before she could answer. Using her free hand, she checked the caller ID. The good witch, Glenda. I'm fine. Glenda was the linchpin, and Glenda was going to make this right, even if Beth wasn't exactly sure what right meant in this instance. Hello, Glenda. I've been expecting your call. Chapter 20 After a brief conversation, Beth hung up the phone. Only then did she realize that her hand was still clasped within Edward's atop the breakfast table. She twined her fingers with his for a brief moment and then let go and stood up. We have a meeting with a witch. I knew it! She admitted it, didn't she, that she's a witch? With that name, how could she not be? Hillary chugged the rest of her beer. Um, I'm not driving, but I'm coming with. Nope, not this time, Beth said. And she didn't admit it in so many words, but close enough. She said she could provide answers if I asked the right questions. That sounds cryptic and witchy to me, Hillary said. Uh-huh. Beth took a step closer to Edward. Voice low, she asked, Are you ready for this? It was an ambiguous question, one that could have had several meanings. Beth wasn't even sure herself what she was asking. But Edward answered, Never more so and then he kissed her. The first time was a blur in her mind. Not this time. This time the experience imprinted on her brain, burned into her lips, and settled into her heart. When she stepped away, Edward traced the line of her jaw with the pad of his thumb. Her eyelids fluttered closed, and she let herself fall into the moment and a little bit in love. Seconds had passed, maybe longer, when Beth opened her eyes. Edward's gaze held hers. Let's go meet a witch. As she turned to leave, she saw Hillary once again sitting at the breakfast table. Hillary waited for Edward to turn his back, then she fanned her face with hands and mouthed, Hot! Beth just grinned. Once she and Edward were in the car, he asked, How long did it take for you to learn to drive? I'm not sure. Maybe a few months? Beth pulled out into the street. He nodded, but didn't elaborate. They drove in silence for several minutes. Unasked questions hung in the air, or at least Beth imagined they did. Time passed too quickly. The shop is only a few minutes away, so... Beth didn't want to ask. Voicing that most important question out loud led to the possibility of a rejection she desperately didn't want to hear. Edward nodded. You'd like to discuss strategy? No. Goals. Edward looked confused, but there wasn't time to sort it out. She'd dithered, and now they'd arrived. Just before she opened the car door, Beth said, I don't think Glenda means us any harm. A friend of Hillary's, well, it's complicated, but whatever is going on, I don't think we're in any danger. Edward nodded, but there was a grim cast to his face, and he walked with a brisk stride that had Beth hustling to keep up. Whatever he was thinking, he was obviously ready to get this meeting over with. Glenda unlocked and opened the shop door for Beth and Edward when they approached. She'd been waiting. It's taken you both long enough. Even neglecting any semblance of greeting and chiding them, Glenda still exuded a certain charm. Or so Beth thought. Edward eyed Glenda suspiciously. Glenda, Edward asked. When Glenda bobbed her neatly coiffed blonde head, he said, we left promptly upon receiving your telephone call. It took us no time at all. Glenda didn't appear concerned. She even smiled warmly at him. Come in, and we'll sort out the details. 
Beth felt like two different conversations were taking place. She followed Glenda further into the shop, but only a few feet. Before we... I need to ask. Beth squared her chin and started again. Are you a witch? Of course, dear. I thought you'd worked that out long ago. Glenda positioned herself behind the sales counter and started to sift through piles of paperwork. She paused in her search long enough to perch a pair of stylish 50s-era reading glasses on her nose. Beth wasn't sure where to even start, but Edward wasn't nearly so reluctant. How did you manage the time traveling? Glenda looked up from her search, seemingly pleased by the question. In a confiding tone, she said, No one ever asks how. Clever boy. The key is the math. Most witches rely on magic, intuition, and luck. But I'm a firm believer in the power of math. She removed her reading glasses and looked at them both. Naturally, there's magic, but math and magic combined, well, look at the two of you. Splendid. She replaced her reading glasses and continued her search. I'm sorry, you moved us through space and time with the power of math? Beth couldn't believe her ears. This lady wasn't a witch, she was a loon. Math and magic, Edward said dryly. As quietly as she could, head tilted away from Glenda, Beth whispered, You believe her? Darling, it's my eyes that are poor, not my hearing. Of course he believes. He's here, isn't he? But there may have been a potion or two involved, a little spell crafting. But the important bit was the math. Glenda crowed with delight and lifted up a manila envelope. Taking a calming breath, Beth exhaled and was about to speak when Glenda cut her off. Unicorns. It was so out of the blue it caught Beth off guard. She exchanged a look with Edward, but he shook his head. When you were a little girl, your very favorite animal in the whole world was the unicorn. You knew they were real in your heart. They weren't fantasy creatures of myth and legend. Unicorns existed. Do you remember? Beth closed her eyes. I'd forgotten that. When she opened them, Glenda peered back with a hint of sadness, just barely tugging at the corners of her mouth. Every child outgrows magic, but sometimes... Sometimes magic finds you again, Glenda brightened. It's one of the perks of my job. Not your position as proprietress of this establishment, I presume. Edward had moved closer to Beth, and he now stood inches from her shoulder. No, no, my other position. Glenda smiled benignly at both Beth and Edward. When they didn't respond, she said, Matchmaker, I gave you my card. Suddenly, Beth remembered. She laughed, more at the absurdity than anything else. Improbable matches made. Turning to Edward, she explained, That's the slogan on Glenda's business cards, the ones for the shop. Big green eyes stared at Beth. You expected matchmaking witch, specializing in math and magic? Glenda seemed to consider this. Times change so fast, it's hard to keep up. I suppose that's a possibility. Uh, maybe that's not a good idea. Beth was feeling guilty like she was leading an innocent astray. But this woman wasn't an innocent. She was a menace. If you're a matchmaker, what could you possibly have been thinking? We're from different times. Not different time zones, which is bad enough. Different points in time. How does that even work? Edward touched her hand, just barely. I stay. But... Beth's heart jumped. She wanted him to. So, so much she wanted him to. But she couldn't ask him to leave his home, his time. He twined his fingers with hers. Voice firm, he said, I'll stay. Giving Glenda a stern look, he said, You can make that happen, can't you? Of course I can, Glenda replied. And exactly as it should be. She peered at Beth over her glasses. Didn't he tell you? He has no one in his time. Beth's heart hurt. No one? Why hadn't she realized? His sister had died young, his wife and child, his parents. She squeezed his hand probably too hard. But it was that or cry. She should have realized. Glenda either didn't notice or ignored Beth's reaction and said, 
You'll need a passport, a birth certificate, a driver's license, no, that one you've got, a social security card, ah, banking information. Ignoring Glenda's chatter, Beth pressed her lips together, then asked Edward, You're certain? I couldn't be more so. Glenda gave Beth a disapproving look. Of course he's certain, I've done the math. You're meant to be, numbers never lie. Now, she stuffed several documents inside the manila envelope, and Beth realized their witchy matchmaker must have been cataloging the contents earlier. Glenda handed the packet to Edward. Your paperwork. Now pay attention. This is very important. What I must have from you both is your consent. Beth shared a look with Edward. He shook his head. I'm afraid I don't understand. You need our consent for what? Glenda peered over the tops of her spectacles, first at Edward, then Beth. I need your mutual consent for the introduction. After sharing a confused look with Edward, Beth said, Truly, you've lost us. Glenda clasped her hands together, then spread them wide, encompassing both Beth and Edward. Your introduction to each other. Glenda wrinkled her nose. That's a matter of perspective, isn't it? The administration is such a stickler for the rules. Interfering in mundane lives without consent, especially in matters of the heart, could get me in a great deal of trouble. She blinked wide green eyes at them both. In this instance, the timing was complicated, but needs must. Well? Yes. Beth and Edward spoke as one. Edward's voice was firm and assured. Beth blurted the response quickly, afraid any hesitation would be perceived as a no. Glenda clapped her hands. Lovely, it's settled. Have a happy life. Off you go. She shooed them to the door. On with your lives and your lovely new... Oh, too soon. Can't say. Bye-bye. And the door clicked behind Beth. What? Beth felt like the world had just spun round at five times its normal speed. Edward sighed. I don't know. I'm fairly certain I don't wish to know. He opened the envelope and flipped through the paperwork. I appear to have a bank account, a trust, set up in... 1899, Beth guessed. When he nodded, she tipped her head and said, Well, at least she didn't rob anyone to provide you with a startup fund. That is fortuitous. I'd rather not start my new life as a thief. He wrapped an arm around her shoulders. You will marry me, won't you, darling? She grinned up at him. Hmm. I'll consider it, if you ask me properly. Fair enough. And you'll teach me to drive. I do have a license. Beth laughed. Yes, she'd marry him. Yes. She'd teach him to drive. Yes. Just yes. Epilogue Why? A deep male voice asked. Glenda removed her reading glasses and swiveled on her stool to look at the small mirror behind the register. Quiet! The girls will hear you. Your staff are in the back room. Why, Beth and Edward? The surface rippled with his vocal vibrations. I may have had a little peek into their futures. The glass turned dark, then lightened again. Their probable futures, futures that you have now irrevocably altered. Glenda rolled her eyes. Please! Altered, yes, but for the better. They would have been alone but for one another forever. Even you couldn't be so cruel, Bedivere. A soft sigh brushed the surface, creating a momentary haze. It's not cruel. It's the natural progression of time. And you still haven't explained why those particular two. There are any number of lost souls wandering through your current point in time. Hmm, yes, but I did the math, and they had the very best possibility of success. Accounting for attraction, personality, family life, interest, sexual compatibility. Enough. You and your magical math. Stick to potions and spells. They're much more reliable. Is that an order from my boss, or the recommendation of a dear friend? The silver surface remained flat. Glenda smiled. Thank you. 
She put her glasses back on and turned back to the good witch's backlogged accounting. This has been Timely Love, The Good Witch Matchmaker, Book One. Written by Kate Lawley. Narrated by Sonia Field. Copyright 2016 by Catherine G. Cobb. Production Copyright 2016 by Catherine G. Cobb.